Okay, well, we're going to break bread thinking about Exodus chapter 16, which is the account of the manna. You know, Israel came out of Egypt, they went through the Red Sea, just like we are baptized, and they went through the wilderness and they were hungry, and God fed them every day with this wonderful, miraculous food called manna. And you may think, what's that got to do with breaking bread? And what's that got to do with the Lord Jesus? Well, John 6, the Lord Jesus clearly alludes to the manna where he says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead, but whoever eats of me and drinks my blood and eats my body will live forever. I am the bread that came down from heaven. And when you look through the gospel records, it's clear that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they record the account of the breaking of bread, but apparently John doesn't. And I suggest that he actually does in the sense that the Lord's words about the manna are intended to be his equivalent of the, the breaking of bread section. So let's pray for our eyes to be opened and about all the different things that uh, everybody's just raised. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you in our lives asking, Father, for your rich blessing upon each of us as we seek to eat of that bread that a man may eat thereof and live forever, the bread of the Lord Jesus. We do really pray that you'll open our eyes to your word, that your spirit might be strong within us, and that we truly might live only on him, on your dear son. We pray, Father, for each of us in the particular issues that we're all facing. We think of Mike and Betty sailing to Indonesia. We pray that you'll bless them and bless their mission there. And please be with Mark and Lisa and I as we set off this day. If it's your will to Ukraine, please preserve us. But above all, bless what we're trying to do to your glory. We pray, Father, that you'll be with all your dear children wherever they might be. We pray for Arash with his issues with accommodation. We pray for Aya and her family, her mum, to respond to the gospel and also her children. And, and we pray that you'll help her with her roof, those issues. Pray for all those seeking asylum and for the changing of laws in the UK at this time. And that, as Siri said, that we might have a heart of compassion and generosity, inspired by your amazing grace to each and every one of us. And we pray that we might not be ever learning and ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth, but that we might really see the simple truth of the Lord Jesus. And that we may trust in you, as Jackie said, that really and truly we may trust in you. We pray, Father, for our families, I think particularly of Phil's daughters, and we do pray that you will bless them and work with them through their issues that, that they have. And we pray for patience for all of us, as and we asked and, and James asked, that we might have that endurance to keep on keeping on, even as you keep on keeping on with us. And we think of Carol and others who are there, really overworked, as it were, by the amount of response they have to the gospel, we pray that you will encourage them and help them to keep on keeping on and help us all to keep on keeping on and to draw closer to you and to really know you and to make you known, to really feel your presence and the presence of the Lord Jesus. Please, Heavenly Father, you know that that's our will and we know that that's your will. And so we confidently ask you for these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So Exodus 16, <clears throat> you might like to have that open. They've come through the Red Sea. And, oh, wow, it was amazing. You know, they've been praising God. Oh, you're the best. You saved us from the Egyptians. And they saw the bodies of the Egyptians there dead on the seashore. And they took their journey, verse 1 from Elim. They came into the wilderness of Sinai. And the whole congregation murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, all of them, not just a few difficult old folks, but the whole congregation murmured and said, we wish we had died by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and we ate our fill of bread. You brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Yahweh said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from the sky for you and the people should go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So <clears throat> they came out 
And when God looks back at his history with them in Jeremiah chapter 2, he says, what a shame that, that you've turned into a prostitute. I remember the love of your youth when you went after me the first time in the wilderness. And that was your time of love. So God looks at them here as if, oh, they're starting to move towards me. They're moving out of Egypt. They're coming towards me. Oh, great. They love me. But they took the idols of Egypt with them through the, through the Red Sea, as Ezekiel says. They carried the tabernacle of Moloch as well as the tabernacle of, uh, of Yahweh through the wilderness. They carried the start of their god, Remphan, as well as the standards of the tribes. So God fooled the world in Jeremiah when he, he says, I look back and, wow, how you loved me. Oh, I was so touched by how you loved me when you went after me and followed me in the wilderness. It all, it all sounds to me like the man who's head over heels in love with this girl who's, who's just a bad girl, who's cranky with him, doesn't really love him, and looking at all these other guys and all that. But, oh, oh, she touches his arm. Oh, she loves me. Oh, you know, any little, little movement. Oh, she likes me. And I'm sure we've all seen that sort of thing. And you see, that's how Israel were with God. But because God loved them, he looked at them so positively. You see, later was to say at the time of Balaam he did not behold iniquity in Jacob that is what love does it if you like imputes righteousness as Paul talks about we are counted righteous but that actually comes out of love that if you love somebody you think they're wonderful and you're eager for any little movement from them towards you and you see that's how God was with Israel and we are ashamed that Israel behaved as they, as they did. That's why we pray, as Aya often reminds us in prayer requests, we pray for Israel to repent and to put this right and to come back to, to God. But in the meantime, God has chosen us, this mixture of, of Jews and Gentiles. And we are his woman. And as I said before, and I will repeat it again, the fact that he had that awful previous experience with Israel means that we look at him and say, look, I'm not, I'm not such a great woman. I'm not such a great person, but I'll tell you, God, I'll tell you, Lord Jesus, I will be loyal to you. I will be loyal to you. I'm not such a great woman. I'm not the pious, you know, guy, but I will be loyal to you. And we will not be, as Israel were, picking up and then letting him go, as it were. Well, they say, verse 3, we wish we had died by the hand of Yahweh. Let's put the stress on the word we. We wish that we had died by the hand of Yahweh. Time and again, this phrase, the hand of Yahweh, is used about what God did at the Passover, when by his hand, he destroyed the Egyptians and brought Israel out. And I have suggested a couple of weeks ago that actually a lot of the Israelites didn't keep the Passover and they died. That's why when you look at the book of Numbers, the numbers of firstborns are extremely low. And you wonder why that is. Think, oh, yeah, because they all got scribbled on Passover night, or a lot of them did. Yeah. So I personally doubt, seeing they were so disobedient, as God says from the day that I knew you, I doubt they all kept the Passover regulations. So a lot of them died. And now the rest of them are saying, huh, wish we had died when the others did back there in Israel. It, at first blush, seems absolutely incredible that Israel, having seen the Red Sea deliverance only recently, having seen the plagues on Egypt and their deliverance from them, could assume that God was actually evil, that God actually had only brought them out so that he might kill them in the wilderness. And as I say, at first blush, that, that might seem incredible that somebody could seriously think that God is bad. When you think about it, yeah, this is how it goes. Either God is amazingly kind and gracious and has brought us out of this world, out of Egypt, so that we might eternally inherit the kingdom. Or, yeah, he's just playing around and he's just being nasty. No. Yeah, they're the two choices. And if you don't believe with all your heart that you're going to be in the kingdom, 
Oh, what's the alternative? Well, God's bad. And yeah, I can see how they fell into this. They didn't believe they were going to be in the kingdom. They didn't have faith. So they assumed that, well, he must be bad then. And he's not. <laughs> all the evidence historically in your life, in my life, all through the Bible, all through God's hand in nature, all through his, his whole, if you like, project with man, shows his absolute grace and desire to save. Well, <clears throat> they complained that back in Egypt they had both bread and meat. And so God says, I will rain bread from the sky for you. And he also gives them quail. All the time they wanted to go back there, didn't they? And, you know, I think this is a sign of spiritual maturity when you have no desire to go back to the world. Doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean you're righteous and pious and, and as you should be. But I think that as you mature, you do come to that point that look, I'm not going back there. You know, sometimes I stop off in a pub or somewhere and I just have a coffee because I don't drink alcohol at all. I have coffee, you know. And I'll sit there and I'll listen to the conversations around me. I, I don't want to go back to that. Doesn't mean I'm pious, doesn't mean I'm as I should be, but I don't want to go back. I don't want to be part of all that. So oh, thank you. And I believe that you're the same. And yet I believe many of you wonder about your spiritual maturity. Well, you don't want to go back to Egypt, right? I think none of you do. I think you all look at it like I do. I'm like, you know, God wants us to. Well, they were told, verse 4, to go out and gather a, a day's portion every day. The thing of the day on its day. And the Lord alludes to that when he says that we should live day by day, that we should trust that God will provide for this day, that we pray, give us this day our daily bread. The bread literally for today. Don't worry about tomorrow, this was his teaching, because sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, evil will come, but you only worry about that when you meet it, not ahead of time. Live every day for the day. And God has promised that he will provide for that day, for that day. Now, this is, no wonder he says, through this I will test you. Because that's incredibly difficult to live like that. To begin each day, please give me my daily bread. I believe you will. When actually we all have food probably in our refrigerators to last us for a few days. When we have all got money somewhere with which to buy food for at least a week. But we are asked to live day by day. This is, as God says, and by this I will test you. Absolutely. That's why Deuteronomy 8, which the Lord quoted in the wilderness, says that they were taught by the manna, that man does not live by bread alone, by just the physical manna, but by every word from God. In other words, that manna was created by God's word in the same way as the manna in the sense of the Lord Jesus was created by God's word. And so, as he says, in this thing, I will test you. This was a daily test daily test as to whether they could trust and live like that now this is really hard especially in our societies in which we live where most of us do not grow our own food and where your survival in the future is based upon basically your savings pension schemes or whatever it might be. And you don't have that sort of physical land around you. And you're not surrounded by your kids and grandkids who are going to keep farming that land and you know, look after you, hopefully, when you get old. And you can't farm it anymore. We live in a different situation. And yet, to live like this, that just I just want for today. And so this was the point of the manner that I will provide for you just for today. That's why, as we're going to read on, the manna went bad. It started to grow worms and stink if you didn't eat it that day. It went off by the morning. So you couldn't store manna. 
only on the sixth day, on the Fridays. Yep, they were, it, it didn't go bad for two days, so they could keep it, so they didn't have to gather it on the Sabbath. <laughs> this is a real challenge, that he will give you your food for today. David says, I have never seen the seed of the righteous begging bread. In other words, God will provide. Now, I've spent all my life traveling around all over the world in very poor countries, situations, and times of war, times of even famine, difficulty. And I would say this, looking back 30 five plus years, more than 35 years of living like that, traveling around, engaging with, with poverty. I would say this, that I have never seen a true believer, a true believer, I'm not talking about humanity generally, I mean a true believer, actually without basic food, and I mean basic food. Never. I've seen plenty of people in poverty, but I've never seen anybody actually, literally, starving because they did not have food. And I've met a lot of poor people. I've seen people sell it for drugs or sell it for alcohol or trade it for something else. Yeah, yeah. But God always provided. Now, that is the challenge to us, that he will provide for me bread and water, yes, and clothes. Remember, their clothes didn't wear out all through the wilderness journey. But they were being taught the difference between needs and wants. Of course, we want more than that. I don't just want manna and water. I want, uh, I don't know, ice cream. I, I want beef burgers. I want, well, you know, all the other things. God said, I give you your clothes. The clothes you're wearing will not wear out. Oh, yeah, but I want, I want this. I want that. Oh, I want that jacket. Oh, yeah, I, I want those jeans. Yeah. And the whole challenge of the manner was that, no, your needs I will provide. Your wants, no. Now, there's some people who like to sort of, I don't know, rationalize the miracle of the manna by saying, oh, well, it was some sort of natural thing that occurs in the wilderness. No, I would argue that this manna was miraculous food. As, <coughs> as the psalm says, man did eat angels' food. That's why they looked at it and said, what is it? They had never seen anything like it. And they're told, uh, verse 5, well, they're told verse 4 to go out and gather it. On the sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. You can read the, this chapter as if God is saying, you must go out, and you must gather one omer per person, and on the sixth day, you must gather twice as much. But I don't think that is how to read it. I read it as if he's saying, you shall go out and what you gather shall be one omer. And on the sixth day, oh, you're going to find it's two omers. In other words, whether you were weak and so you couldn't gather much, or whether you were strong and materialistic and went and gathered as much as you could, when you came home and prepared it, it still worked out at one omer per person. And on the sixth day, you found that no matter how much you gathered, it was two omens. So I think that that's the idea, that whether you are you know, a great gatherer or not, you end up with still the same, this one omer, this one and a half liters, roughly, of manna. And it's through this, verse 6, that you shall know that Yahweh has brought you out from Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of Yahweh. And when that cloud of glory went up, they saw the manna. So I think that what it's saying is that through this daily discipline, and Christianity is about daily discipline, you learn. Through that daily discipline, 
you learn that truly this wonderful God is with me and is going to provide. No unbeliever has this amazing life experience. They were being told, do not worry about tomorrow. The manna is going to be there. And they were told, verse 8 and verse 12, that the bread, the manna, will fully satisfy you. It will fully satisfy you. So this was miracle food. They had it uh, and ate it, it seems to me, in the morning after it was given to them. And it tasted, we're told, like fresh oil. So it, like it had been freshly made. And they couldn't keep it until the morning, as it bred worms and stunk. They had to eat it. The other thing you notice about this, what I would call miracle food, is that each person had the same amount. Now, when it comes to physical food intake, different organisms require different amounts of food. Some big hunky bloke who works cutting trees down all day, yeah, he needs to eat more food than a frail old lady of 95. A child needs less food than adults. But they were to eat the same amount, an oma per person. So it was a miracle. No matter how much you gathered, it still worked out at one omer, let's say one and a half liters or so of manna per person. You ate it, you were fully satisfied. The matter how big you were, how weak you were, how little you were, how old you were, didn't make any difference. What about the quails? Well, unlike the manna, the quails, I mean, the quails are birds that you can, uh, you know, identify today and that are still eaten in that part of the world. I think the quails only came twice and two occasions. One is now when they were saying, oh, we want to have, uh, you know, meat like we had and bread like we had in Egypt. God's saying, right, here's the manna. You're fully satisfied with the manna? Okay, I'll just give you the quail. But you see, you didn't need the quail, did you? Now, later on in Numbers, you see, Exodus is the account of their journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai. Book of Numbers, or in the Hebrew, in the wilderness, that book is called it's a story of their journey from Sinai to the Promised Land. Well, yes, later on, at Kibroth Hatavar, they did have this desire for, for meat. And again, they were sent quails and they ate so much of them that they died of it and God slew them. And that the place was called the Graves of Lust. So you see there how I think God was saying, look, I'll give you that extra bit, but you don't need it, do you? To try to teach them. But no, the manna is enough. You know, you may get that in your own life. You may get a windfall. And you may spend it on yourself. And afterwards you think, eh, I didn't need that, did I? Yeah, that's how God works with us now. And yet, one theme you see through here is that man seeks for more than his basic needs. Some of them tried to keep their manna until the morning, but it bred worms and stunk. God said on the Friday, I'll give you two days worth of manna. So you mustn't go out on the Saturday and try and gather it. You've got two days worth. But they still went out on the Saturday and looked for it. And God was angry. Because they wanted more. And as I say, later on in Numbers, they like, oh, well, we're bored of this manna. We want meat. Okay, you'll have meat to eat as much as you can, and it will make you sick. So we are never satisfied when we're looking in the life in that materialistic sense. And we live in an age of absolutely manic consumerism, of materialism and luxury living such as never before. The sort of conversations you overhear go like this. Oh, it was uh, my cousin's birthday, and I bought a box of chocolates. It cost 50 quid. I spent 50 quid on a box of chocolates, and you boast about that to your mates, and you think that's cool. Huh. You're just pathetic as a person. Oh, we went on holiday. How'd you get on? Oh, it was great. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we spent a lot. I'm in debt. I've got a lot of credit card debt now. 
you know, we, we was buying these pizzas like they was like 50 euros a pop. Every night we were down a pizza place, but it was lovely, it was gorgeous. You know, think that's cool. No, you just need to get a life. You need to get a life, my friend. And luxury living is boasted about on Facebook and all sorts of things. Look at this fantastic car I've bought. Or, oh, I'd love to have this car. Or my neighbor's got this. Oh, yeah, I'd love to get that. This is, well, the sign is true. This is consumerism and uh, an addiction. It's an addiction to luxury living, such as has never been amongst ordinary folks like you and me. And you, we can get caught up in that. And the message of the manor was, is this, that yes, you will always want the extra, won't you? But be satisfied with what I give you. And of course, this becomes even more relevant when the Lord Jesus picks all this up in John 6 and says, look, the manor is me. I am your manner. He that eats me will live forever. And, you know, this is all symbolized, isn't it, in the, in the bread and the wine. He says, he's alluding to the breaking of bread, and he says, you've got to eat me. I am the bread that came down from heaven. I am the equivalent of that manner. It doesn't mean that he floated down from heaven in a you know, pre-existent form or whatever. He's just saying, as the manner was created by God's word, and man shall not live just by that manner, but by every word of command from God. So I am that manner, also created here on earth, as it were, inside the womb of Mary, by God's word. And so what you see there is the Lord saying, look, yeah, and in the same way, I, day by day, will provide for you. You will be fully satisfied. Yes, like Israel, you will want something else. But no, I am your full satisfaction. And I suggest that in the same way as they were given manna for the day. So he gives us daily what we need spiritually. But it is for us to go out and gather it. That's the thing. You have got to make some effort to go out and gather it. This is why it sounds very much old school, but I will say it because it's true. Daily discipline, like daily reading of the Bible, and I think starting the day on the right track in the right gear spiritually is so important. Like they had to gather the manna in the morning. And I suggest starting your day in the right gear is what matters. And practically, what does that mean? For many of us, kids or jobs or whatever, it means setting your alarm clock earlier so that you do have that extra quarter of an hour in the morning you can do this you can set your alarm clock earlier these things are the key to spiritual life and if you are you know, at a point where you don't have to work children are grown up or you don't have uh, domestic responsibilities for whatever reason you know use it you know <laughs> sit around in bed get up and gather that manner because that is what will keep us going this is what it's all about so what i'm saying is that when for example you come to verse 16 gather of it everyone according to his eating and omer ahead according to the number of your persons you shall take it i'm saying that that sort of thing is it can be read two ways you can read it as a commandment you go out and gather it gather one omer per head of your household or you can read it how i am reading it and actually how the how the jews read it they argue grammatically that it means as they say though i'm not sure it does but anyway what i'm saying what they're saying is that what it means is <clears throat> yes you shall gather an omo ahead in that no matter how much you go and gather or how little you gather when you come home it's one omo three pints one and a half liters And getting back to the material side of things, you know, there are people, I suppose everyone's wired differently, but there are some people who are just maximum gatherers. I want this, I want that. I want to get as much as I can. I want a nice house. I want two nice, expensive cars. I want holidays, an expensive holiday. So 
But when all is said and done, and when man faces his grave place, as we each will, that's for sure, we shall each face our grave place. Well, you all gathered the same. And the only thing was the manna. The only thing was God's gift to you. And that is, of course, above all, in the Lord Jesus. So <clears throat> they did so, verse 17, and they gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, he who gathered much had nothing over, and he who gathered little had no lack. They gathered at every man according to his eating. Well, this is a huge challenge, but it all comes out at the same. You're fat, you're thin, you're smart, you're stupid, you're lucky, you're unlucky. You were born with, you know, born into wealth, you weren't. These sort of issues mean a lot to the materialistic unbeliever. But for us taking this lesson, it all comes out of the same. It all comes out of the very same in the end, because the only thing that matters is the is the manner. Now, Moses comments on this in Deuteronomy 8. He says that he humbled you by feeding you with manna. He humbled you by feeding you with manna. It is humbling to live like this. Just say, look, give me this day, Father, my daily bread. Thank you. And I know you will, you will do so. He always does. There's not a day in your life nor my life where God said, no, I'm not feeding you today. Go hungry. No, never. Nor has there been, I, I believe, in the lives of any of God's true children. So he humbled you, feeding you with manna. It is humbling that I have been given this for today, and it shall be enough. And spiritually, we have been given everything in the Lord Jesus for today. And on this, in this strength, I will reach God's kingdom. I will reach Canaan. I will get through the wilderness. So this is not a call to like asceticism, as it were, but to simply accept that we will be fully satisfied, that we will gather enough. As I said, verse 19, Moses said, don't leave of it until the morning. Well, this is, <laughs> you can't save it for tomorrow. This is the Lord's teaching. Take no anxious thought for tomorrow. You could reason from that verse that they were really being told, you're each given an omer, a meter and a half, three pints of this manna. You've got to eat it all. Don't leave it until the morning. So children, adults, old people, everybody, male, female, all the same. Eat it, and you could argue, prepare it and eat it in the morning, and that's it. And you will be fully satisfied. Don't just eat part of it. Don't pick and poke it, but eat the whole thing. And don't leave any of it. So it was miraculous. This food was miraculous. This was not, this was angel's food, we're told in Psalm 78. And again, verse 22, on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, and they come and tell, tell Moses. Well, the implication is, I think, that they gathered, this is the first time, by the way, that they kept the Sabbath. They gathered their food, and oh, it, it worked out not at one omer, but two omers. That's why they run and tell Moses, what's happened? This is strange. I said this is the first time they kept the Sabbath. Yeah, now Moses is going to say, yeah, he explains to them why that happened. Yes, because on the, on, the, on the seventh day, you are to rest. This is the first time the word Sabbath really occurs in the Bible. There's implications of it from God resting on the seventh day of creation. And there's hints at it previously in the book of Genesis, a few hints at it. But this is the first time they are told to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath, of course, was in the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Commandments haven't been given yet. And you think, why is there the connection between the manna and the Sabbath? Well, it's because the two things were intended to sort of be mechanisms to teach the same thing. Don't go helter-skelter. Work, work, work. It's the idea of the Sabbath was not simply to give 
work as a day off. It was that. But I think it was to also stop that sort of middle class attitude of, of, of being a workaholic. I will work, 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 work to gather as much as I can for myself. No stop. Sabbath, no working, nothing. And that's why it comes at the same time as the manna, which was teaching the same lesson. You can't save anything till tomorrow. The only time you could store anything up was on a Friday night in preparation for the Sabbath. Well, as Hebrews 4 explains, the kingdom of God is likened to the Sabbath rest. So anything you do store up, you can only store stuff up against the kingdom of God. Well, on the seventh day, 27, some of them do go out to gather, but they didn't find any. Yeah, it's just an incredible example of that human desire for more. That confusion of my needs with my wants. I want more. Sin is never satisfied. But you could also say, it looks forward to how in the kingdom of God, when the seventh day comes, some people will go to find Christ. But like the, the girls in the parable who go to try to buy oil when it's too late, it will be too late. So just recognize that about yourself, that there is something in you that will never be satisfied. You will always want more. And just accept the manner. Just accept it. And stop looking around, oh, he's got more, she's got a better car than me. Oh, no, oh, their kids are better, oh, better turned out than ours. Yeah, no, no, you've got it. You've got it all in him. And, you know, this is why the Lord Jesus says, eat me, eat my words. My words are spirit. My words are life. Now, what does this word manner mean? Well, you could say it means, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was in the same way as secular, unbelieving people have no idea about the things we're talking about. They have no idea. What is it? Huh? What on earth are you talking about? And Israel were like that, actually. They said, what is it? And that's why Moses says, the manna is what you knew not, neither you nor your fathers. Totally unknown to them. But looking at this word manna in the Hebrew, it is related to the word gift, which is, of course, what grace means. Grace means gift. And the ultimate gift, of course, is the Lord Jesus, but they didn't want that. They wanted to go back to Egypt and sit there by the flesh pots of Egypt. That's what they wanted, quite honestly. Whereas so much more was made possible for them. And of course, 34, at the end, they lay out some of the manna before the testimony. Well, what was the testimony? The testimony was, as later on, uh, the tables of testimony bearing the uh, Ten Commandments, called the, the testimony later on in Exodus. Uh, and I think what it's saying then is that that manna, which miraculously lasted forever and didn't breed worms and stink, this hidden manna, as the Lord later called it, is the absolute essence of all God's commandments. That's why the pot of manna was intended to be put before the testimony, before the, stone, the, the two tables of stone, which had the testimony, the Ten Commandments on them. Because this is the essence of it all, to live each day materially, trusting in his provision, and not spending brain space, head space, and trying to create a, a great financial future for ourselves. And especially, the whole spirit of all this is that I will provide you spiritually every day with what you need. I am the bread of life. I am the bread that came down from heaven. I am the manna. For you, in your situation, as people who came out of the world, out of Egypt, got baptized, and now in the wilderness, I am the bread. I am that manna. And I will give myself to you day by day. And you will be fully satisfied. 
again, Paul alludes to them when he says, I have all things under bound, although I'm beaten up and I have no stable dwelling place and all the rest of it, I have everything. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. I've got everything in Christ. Now, yeah, this is not just me trying to be positive with you. This is how it is. We have everything in him. And we will be fully satisfied. Well, I'd like to um, just conclude then with, with, with going back to John 6. And let's read through uh, the Lord's words there. Because, you know, he, he's, made the, um, he's made the bread and they all think, oh, that's wonderful fed the uh, thousands of people but he's saying look this is not the real view let me explain verse 48 of john 6 i am the bread of life your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died this is the bread and i think he was pointing to himself this is the bread which comes down out of heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die i am the living bread the manna that came down from heaven if anyone eats of this bread he will live forever Yes, the bread which I will give is my flesh given for the life of the world. So therefore, the manna doesn't simply represent Jesus. It represents him crucified. The bread which I will give is my flesh, which is given for the life of the world, which is on the cross. And the Jews started to argue, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And the Lord replies to them, truly, truly, I say to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood. You do not have life in yourselves. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is the true food, and my blood is the true drink. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So this is the true drink. This is the true food. In other words, this is the life. People like to say that, don't they? Ah, this is the life, you know, sitting and eating, you know, 50 quid pizzas and all this kind of thing. No, this is the life. Him. And we have all things. And we are bound. Let's, let's do what he says. Eat this bread, which represents him. Um, I wonder, Mike, could you um, lead us in thanks for the, uh, for the bread? Sure. Gracious Father, we uh, are truly thankful. Mike. Yes. No? No, we're not hearing you. Um, no, I'll, I'll try to. I can hear him. I can hear him. Maybe why you've just uh, yeah, well. maybe uh, uh Can you hear me now? To give thanks for the bread. Can you hear me now, Duncan? No, we still can't hear you, Mike. Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. Um, the rest uh, of us can. Yeah, it must be your end, Duncan. Yeah, I can hear him. I don't think he's hearing anyone right now. She's driving. Uh, oh. Siri, could you give thanks for the bread? Oh, dear. Okay. Um, I'm just going to message him. <laughs> uh, Phil was not then. Could you give thanks for the bread? You need to unmute yourself, yeah. Yep. And I yeah, it's amazing. Okay. Give thanks for the bread. Precious Heavenly Father, we draw before you thankful for the wonderful life of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he was willing to give his life. And Father, we would ask thee that as you've considered today, that we may live our life more and more patterned on your son having the grace and the ongoing belief that in your love you will look after us throughout any of those issues and we thank you that Jesus too showed that same reliance and trust and confidence in you. Please be with us now Heavenly Father as we 
share this bread which speaks to us of his given body for us. We ask your guidance and direction and offer you our praise through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Can you still hear me? Can you? Because I can't hear any of you. Okay. So oh, okay. this bread is the oh. symbol of him. This is the true bread. This is the true life. That's okay. So the cup represents his blood, that this is the true life. This is the real life. I'm sorry that I, I can't hear you all, but I believe that you can hear each other. That's the main thing. Um, Mike, uh, would you like to uh, give thanks for the uh, cup? Our loving Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, uh, we remember your dear son in this emblem now, the cup, which symbolizes his blood, which he shed for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your courage and your, your love for your father and for us and dear lord we are truly thankful we remember you now remember your great love your forgiveness and your resurrection in this uh, in this uh, emblems of the uh, wine before us symbolizing your blood thank you lord jesus so this then is the true life 